much better. No? Much better. The one thing I would do is uh, when you get to the bottom of three, when you
Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so that he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their inequities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
the word of the Lord. Our reading, Psalm 22, let us read responsively by alternate verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Glory, Glory to, to the Father, Father and, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love the good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord.
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and tortures, torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Judeans arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Judeans that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Judeans come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing by struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, Is this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, The Judeans replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Judeans? 
Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Judeans. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the people again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for him. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Judeans? They shouted in reply, Now Barabbas was a bandit. <coughs> then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, When the chief priests and the police saw them, saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, The Judeans answered him, Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus. Pilate? Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Judeans cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. If everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Judeans, They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucified! Pilate asked them, the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate had also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Judeans said to Pilate, Do not write Pilate answered, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, 
They took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but pass lots for it, which is he who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sou- full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Judeans did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Judeans, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the custom of the Judeans. Now, There was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Judean's day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they they laid Jesus there. The word of the Lord.
I share this not for your sympathy, but because I think that I may not be alone in this experience. The relative attendance today, despite it being a day that many have off work and schools are closed, compared to what we will see on Sunday morning, I think is a testament to this. The culture that I grew up in doesn't like to spend too much time dwelling on bad news. We were often invited to chin up or move on after some sort of bad experience. And truthfully, I didn't have any major tragedies in my own life growing up. I had grandparents die. I had pets die. I had friends move away, and our family moved when I was 13. But largely, I was shielded from most of the really bad things that can happen to you as a child. Loss and death were something that I barely understood. And the few times I saw my parents going through something really hard, they seemed to exist at the extremes of experience. My father was always stoic and calm as is often the expectation of fathers. And my mother kept calm as well, to the extent that she could. But then sometimes she would be overcome and get lost in her feelings, only to express tremendous guilt later for what she had shown. I wonder if these sorts of patterns are familiar to any of you. It seems consistent with our culture's expectations of us. Bad feelings or unpleasant feelings are kept below the surface to the extent possible until they force their way out. And then when they are expressed, it happens quickly, without ceremony, perhaps even wildly. And thus, sadness and grief begin to appear unpredictable or dangerous. And so Good Friday's direct engagement with the pain of Jesus' final hours and ultimate death runs counter to our well-rehearsed expectations. It doesn't adhere to our standards of stoic public behavior. And it also doesn't resemble the outbursts of pain that break their way through our attempts at control. No, what's happening today is something different. Today, we looked directly into the face of Jesus on the cross, and we stay here in this moment. It's rare in church that we spend more time with the death of Jesus than we do with the resurrection. But today we pause and we remember what happened. What happened, the role of people bringing it about, and how something like that could possibly happen again today, or indeed how things like that do happen today. Good Friday packs it all together and invites us to dwell in the moment, to experience the full impact of sin in the world, of sin in our own lives, and the deep love of God to join us on this earth, to fully experience the impact of our brokenness, and to die to save us. All over the world today, Christians are gathered to remember this moment in ways that have been used going back at least to the 4th century. Our earliest account of Good Friday is from a woman named Egeria, who traveled from somewhere in the Western Roman Empire to Jerusalem to experience Holy Week. She tells us how in the 380s, Good Friday was remembered by reading the same passage from John 
that we read today. We repeat the same story, remembering what happened. In some churches, even some Episcopal churches, Christians bring their bodies into play, venerating a wooden cross just as pilgrims in the fourth century paid their respects to fragments of the cross on which they believed that Jesus had died. These ancient practices ask us to dwell in this experience, in this pain, the pain of Jesus' death, the pain of losing loved ones, the pain of every human death, the pain of each person who dies unnecessarily, the pain of our own sin and how we hurt one another, the pain of our own callousness and resistance to change. We look directly into the forces, into the face of the forces of sin and death that hurt us and hurt the whole world. And we recognize that they are powerful. Powerful enemies, powerful instigators, powerful temptations. This day forces us to look not only at the powers of evil in the world, but also the powers of evil within ourselves. On Good Friday, we grieve not only the death of Christ, but also the parts of ourselves that seem to be dead or bring death to others. It's not an easy place to be. Today we recognize the knowledge of evil that the first humans claimed in the garden at the beginning of time, and the tremendous gift that God sent in the form of Jesus to bear the consequences of that evil. In a normal sermon, this is where I want to begin to turn the corner, to shift our attention from the pain of the cross to the miracle of resurrection. That's the job of the preacher after all, right? To break open the good news to the people. But today I'm not gonna do quite that. I invite you to come back on Easter morning to hear the end of the story. Today, instead, I am going to try to remain here with you in this uneasy place. To remain with the altar that has been stripped clean of all its fine linen and candles. candles. To remain dressed only in a plain black cassock rather than our normal vestments. To remain with the experience of our own pain and the knowledge of our impact on each other and the world. 500 years ago, the Spanish Catholic priest Ignatius of Loyola, who went on to found the Jesuits, made this moment the heart of his spiritual exercises, inviting the seeker to dwell with Christ in his passion. Here is what he said. I ask for what I desire. Here is what is proper for the passion. I ask for sorrow with Christ in sorrow. I ask for a broken spirit with Christ so broken. I ask for tears and I ask for interior suffering because of the great suffering Christ endured for me. Ignatius encourages his directees to allow the Holy Spirit to bring them into this very moment, to experience the sights and sounds and even smells of the passion. Because through that, we might be able to feel just for a moment what Jesus
Jesus feels for us. To remain with Jesus as he remains with us. Because without this moment, there is no Easter moment. Without the cross, there is no empty tomb. And without death, there is no resurrection. So we wait. We dwell. We remain. And trust that God has not abandoned us, just as we have not abandoned Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Lawrence, Bill, Daniel, and Geraldine, our bishops, for Gideon and Mary Beth, our priests, and Michaud, our Haitian partner priest, 
and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our prayers and supplications which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them, for Joe, the President of the United States, for Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people who possess an eternal covenant with the Lord, who delivered them from bondage to freedom, for continued faithfulness to God's covenant with them, for their faithful flourishing in peace as witnesses to God's sustaining love, for safety from all malice and harm, for the fullness of redemption for the sake of God's name that unity and concord may exist between Jews and Christians in obedience to God's will. God of Abraham, you planted your people Israel as the root and grafted Gentiles as wild branches into a single olive tree of praise to you. As we come near to the cross, we lament Christian acts of prejudice and violence against your faithful people, of whom Jesus Christ was born. So bless the children of your covenant, that we together may attain the fullness of your blessing for the world. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind. For those who are hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed. For those who are ill or disabled in body, mind, or spirit. For those in loneliness, fear, and anguish. For those who face temptation, doubt, and despair. For those who are sorrowful and bereaved. For those who are persecuted for the sake of Christ. For prisoners, refugees, and captives. For victims of war, genocide, and trafficking. And all those in mortal danger. That God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them. And grant them the knowledge of his love. And stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for those who have not embraced God's redemptive love. For those who have never heard the word of salvation. For those who have lost their faith. For those hardened by sin or indifference. For the contemptuous and the scornful. For those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples. For those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others. That God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, the source of life and fountain of mercy, let the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, be preached with grace and love. Turn the hearts of the followers of Jesus who have harmed others in Christ's name. Lead all to repentance and amendment of life and sustain by your loving grace all who lift their eyes to you. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Amen. Father, who Amen. art in heaven, Amen. hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. We pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.